Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing the psychiatric emergencies. Now, this is a two-part lecture. This lecture, we're going to talk about the first four psych emergencies that you need to know. And uh, in the next lecture, we're going to be discussing the part two of uh, these the psych emergencies. Now, if you guys don't know, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash madmedicine, you can find the USMLE Step 1 Psych Study Guide or Study Playlist. So just go to our channel right here and uh, check it out while you're studying. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe to our channel when you guys uh, get to our channel. Yeah. All right. So let's just start talking about psychiatric emergencies. All psychiatric or most psychiatric emergencies, I want to say, are usually caused by medication and substances that patients are taking. Very rarely does it happen but on its own. Sometimes it can. Now these must be treated as soon as possible. Hence, they are called psychiatric emergencies. Da, da, da. Yeah, that's why we call them psychiatric emergencies. Now this is all because uh, the acute disturbance of behavior, thought, or mood in a patient if it's untreated, may lead to them harming themselves or others, and uh, it can even be a harm to the environment. So you want to prevent all these negative consequences that can occur during psych, uh, psych emergencies because most of the time these patients don't really know what's happening or they don't know what's happening within them and how dangerous their condition is. So you want to treat these uh, conditions right away. Now when it comes to these emergencies, there are several you need to know for step one. And all of these psych Psychiatric emergencies are pretty high yield. Now we've already discussed uh, bits and pieces of the uh, these emergencies already, but I'm gonna uh, tell you that today in this lecture we're gonna be discussing these four psych emergencies. The rest of these four psych emergencies are gonna be done in part two of our lecture. So with that being said, let's just dive deep into it and let's start off by talking about the serotonin syndrome. The serotonin syndrome can be caused by any drug that increases serotonin levels, 5-hydroxytryptamine, aka serotonin. Now these can be psychiatric drugs like SSRIs, SNRIs, monoamine oxidase inhibitors, tricyclic antidepressants, but most likely it's going to be monoamine along with another drug. Velazidone and vortioxetine, which are atypical antidepressants, can also also cause these uh, side effects. And then when it comes to non-psychologic uh, or non-psychiatric drugs that are used for uh, psychiatric uh, treatment, you have tramadol, uh, odinestrone, trypt tryptans, MDMA or ecstasy, dexamethformin, and meperidine, along with a natural substance called St. John's wort. And I highly recommend you guys remember this because I remember when I was studying for step one, I didn't know what St. John's wort was. Uh, I think if I remember properly, it's an herbal supplement used to decrease, I want to say, uh, uh, in inflammation and uh, pain, but it can lead to increased levels of serotonin. It's a natural substance. So you want to make sure you remember St. John's wort leading to an increased level of serotonin. Serotonin. Now, the manifestations of the serotonin syndrome are going to be the three A's. These patients are going to have activity problems like clonus, hyperreflexia, hypertonia, tremors, and seizures. They're going to have autonomic instability like hyperthermia, they're going to be sweating a lot, and they may have diarrhea, as well as altered mental status. So these are the three A's, and try to commit these to memory because it makes it very easy to uh, realize that someone is going through serotonin syndrome when you realize that they're taking a psychiatric drug or any of these psychiatric substances. Now, just so you know, usually the way they're going to present this to you at the USMLA Step 1 level is going to be a patient who has a history of depression who's taking medication for depression, first line medication, that should clue you in to SSRIs or SNRIs, right? Ends up also uh, taking some other medication. They're going to present with activity problems, autonomic problems, and altered mental status. Now, when you do a workup, you're going to ask, oh, what medications have they been taking? They're going to say SSRIs, SNRIs, and St. John's Ward. That should clue you in to them going through uh, a serotonin syndrome that's happening. Now, when you want to treat these patients, when, you, uh, when you're trying to treat these patients, you want to give a drug called ciproheptadine. Ciproheptadine is a serotonin 2 receptor antagonist, which is going to block the serotonin 2 receptor, allowing for decreased uh, 5-HT binding, and that will help uh, treat these symptoms. But even though you have an increased levels of serotonin, because it can't bind to the receptor, you're not going to see the effects actually playing out. 
So that is the serotonin syndrome in a nutshell. Most of the stuff you need to know are is written right here. Spend time with it. Don't forget the stuff. It is pretty high yield. And I remember I got several questions about serotonin syndrome while I was studying for step one. The next uh, emergency is going to be hypertensive crisis. Now, hypertensive crisis is defined as someone having a significantly elevated blood pressure with a systolic over 180 and a diastolic over 120. So the key giveaway is going to be someone who presents with blood pressure uh, greater than or equal to 120 over 180 over 120. That's the key giveaway. Now, usually, usually, this occurs in monoamine oxidase inhibitors, uh, patients who are taking MAOIs along with uh, something else. Now, we're going to talk about that right now. So, monoamine oxidase inhibitors inhibit the breakdown of monoamines, also known as serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. Those are called monoamines. And uh, MAOIs inhibit the breakdown in the presynaptic neuron. This leads to increased levels of these monoamines in the synaptic cleft, and some of the drugs for monoamines that you need to know about it are right here. Uh, Tranocypromine, uh, phenylzine, isocarbazid, and selegiline or selegiline. I can never figure out how to pronounce that G in selegiline. Uh, anyways, what ends up happening is patients who are taking MAOIs, man, a lot of mistakes. Sorry, not MOA. M AOI, monoamine inhibitors. Patients who are taking monoamine inhibitors are going to end up eating um, something called uh, tyramine-rich foods, right? Tyramine is a naturally occurring monoamine that occurs in, uh, that's available in foods like cheeses, alcohol, cured meats, and chocolate. So when a patient eats any of these foods along with their monoamine oxidase inhibitor, they're going to have increased levels of these uh, tyramine, which is a naturally occurring mon monoamine, and it's going to have systemic effects in the body. Okay, the classic scenario is going to be a middle-aged man who presents to the clinic with a difficulty breathing. Most likely, they ended up eating uh, these these foods, and uh, now they have a very high blood pressure. So let's talk a little bit more about the hypertensive crisis and what happens. Like I said, tyramine is a naturally occurring monoamine, right? That uh, causes sympathetic activation. So you see this. The mean group right here, it only has one uh, uh, R group attached to it, therefore it's a monoamine. Now, when the tyramine is, is eaten, when these foods are eaten that have tyramine in them, normally the gut metabolism is going to inactivate the monoamine, the tyramine, right? Because you have in monoamine oxidases in your gut anyways. Now, what ends up happening is be, when you take a monoamine inhibitor, you are inhibiting those monoamine oxidases, and it's going to lead to increased tyramine entering into the bloodstream and causing a hypertensive crisis via stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system. Now, you want to watch out in this case uh, for many things. And the first thing is that tyramine is going to displace all the other neurotransmitters. So let's just write this down. Tyramine is a lot stronger than the other neurotransmitters slash monoamines. Now, one consequence of this hypertensive crisis is going to be flame hemorrhages. These are retinal hemorrhages due to hypertensive retinopathy, and you can see it in this picture right here. You can see this flame-like uh, vascular blood occluding right here. Because you have such high uh, blood pressure, the vessels end up rupturing, they have a hemorrhage, and it leads to leaking blood in the, the retina right here. So you want to make sure you see, if you see this picture, they're talking about hypertensive crisis, especially in a psychiatric setting, it's probably due to the monoamine oxidase inhibitors. The treatment for this is going to be uh, phentalamine, okay, phentalamine, which is an alpha adrenergic blocker that's going to cause vasodilation. That's what's going to end up happening. So you want to give phentalamine to these patients who are going through a hypertensive crisis. The next uh, uh, psychiatric emergency is called the Neuroleptic Malignant Syndrome, NMS. Now, this is going to be more common in the high-potency uh, first-generation antipsychotics like haloperidol, uh, trifluperazine, and flufenazine, the high-potency first-gen antipsychotics. This can happen in any class. Honestly, it can also happen in the second-gen antipsychotics, but most likely it's going to happen in the high-potency first-gen uh, antipsychotics, the typical antipsychotics. And this can also be caused by any dopamine-blocking agent. 
along with a genetic predisposition. One thing to remember is that the NMS, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, can happen at any time, and you don't need to watch out for a timeline. Usually with the EPS system, the symptoms, the extrapyramidal symptoms, you're going to have a timeline that's going to correspond to the symptoms that are happening. In NMS, in the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, there's no timeline. So the symptoms are going to consist of patients presenting with myoglobinuria or rhabdomyolysis. They're going to have fever, encephalopathy. Uh, their vitals are going to be unstable along with, uh, cardi- uh, with their elevations of their en- enzymes like uh, CK. And they're also going to have lead pipe muscle rigidity. This is very, very important. And I'm putting a gigantic box around this to make you guys understand that this is a hallmark presentation of the neuroleptic malignant syndrome. This is very high yield, so don't forget that. Because of this lead pipe rigidity, you're gonna have the cardiac, the the enzyme elevation, you're also gonna have rhabdomyolysis occurring. Now this is very diff- easy to distinguish from serotonin syndrome, and you should be able to distinguish it because in serotonin syndrome, you're gonna have myoclonic rigidity, not lead pipe rigidity. You're gonna have increased levels of serotonin, and patients are gonna present with flushing. Now when it comes to treating NMS, the neuroleptic malignant syndrome, you should use three-pronged approach. You should have um, a muscle relaxant, specifically dantrolene, that you can use to treat the muscle rigidity. You should use bromocryptine, which is a dopamine agonist, okay, which is also going to aid in the uh, sedative effects that you should have. Um, and then finally, sorry, the anti-sedation effects. And finally, you want to make sure you discontinue any causative agent. So if they're taking a first gen antipsychotic, you want to discontinue that antipsychotic. Now, finally, uh, the very last psychiatric emergency for this lecture is going to be delirium tremens. Okay, uh, delirium tremens usually occurs after uh, seventy-two to ninety-six hours after a patient who is. Uh, who has alcohol addiction ingests alcohol. This only happens in chronic alcohol abusers, patients who are dependent on alcohol. So that's very important. And this is going to be the most, most severe manifestation of withdrawal. Now, when we're trying to treat alcohol withdrawal, this is the main thing we're trying to prevent. We're trying to prevent a patient from going into DTs. Okay, that's the main thing. Now, the symptoms are going to be delirium with altered mental status. You're going to have patients being very agitated as well. And uh, that's really important because usually one of the first thing that's really important is that their um, altered mental status is going to be very, very important. They're not going to be in a normal state of mind. And that's going to lead to the agitation. And then they're also going to have drenching sweat and fever as well as autonomic hyperreactivity like hypertension and tachycardia. Now, when it comes to death, most often, Often, this is going to happen due to the hyperthermia, the drenching sweat. Uh, Because you're sweating so much, you're going to have decrease in electrolytes. Okay, and that can lead to arrhythmias. And uh, the fluid electrolyte abnormality can also occur, like I said, due to the sweat. This is very important because if you go into delirium tremens, it can be life-threatening and usually is. And death can often occur when patients withdraw uh, from alcohol without proper treatment. This is one of the very few withdrawals, these drug withdrawals, that will actually kill you. So that's very important to understand. Usually the rest of the withdrawals, opioids, stimulants, depressants, honestly are going to make you feel like crap. You're just going to feel like shit after you've uh, taken the drugs or the stimulants or depressants, etc. With alcohol, you can actually die. So be very, very careful. Now, that is all for this lecture. Thank you so much for watching. We're done with part one of the psychiatric emergencies. So go ahead and go on to the next episode or the next video, uh, the next lecture, where we talk about part two of these psychiatric emergencies. And don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. And if you guys don't know, you can find our podcast on any, uh, you can find our lectures on any podcast service provider for free. Just search Mad Medicine and we'll be able to pop up. Continue on to the next lecture where we're going to talk about uh, the rest of the psychiatric emergencies.